In terms of technology companies, WSP will not be presenting. We're going to run through the ones on the list, and we're going to try and squeeze in a little bit of a presentation by, I knew this a minute ago, Vianova, the Finnish company. Okay, and I'm going to try and make mine relatively quick. I'm with the Advanced Highway Maintenance and Construction Technology Research Center. We're a uh, research center at the University of California at Davis. We're a cooperative research center with Caltrans, and in particular with the Division of Research and Innovation. So we work very closely with Larry Orcutt's group. We also work with maintenance, with Office of Land Surveys, uh, Structures Maintenance, uh, Operations, so kind of across the board within Caltrans. I'm going to be talking about data-driven automation for highway maintenance. A lot of our focus over the years has been towards the maintenance side. We're also looking at things now that tie in more closely with the construction side. Part of the reason we focus so much on maintenance is Caltrans, we see them as our customer, and they're the ones who are responsible for the maintenance, whereas most of the construction is contracted out. So I think this is fairly apparent to everybody in the room. You've got to actually move the dirt when you're doing the maintenance or doing the construction. And when we're talking about data-driven, we see it falling into a couple of different areas. Robotics and automation, which is an area that we've specialized in for the last 15 years or so. Uh, also, a lot of sensing, GPS, GIS. Laser sensing is a new thing for us. We've been diving in headfirst with a lot of education from land surveys. And then we're in the information technology side, web-based browsers, database systems, wireless technologies, a lot of open source software, these kinds of things. So really briefly, this is just one view of an architecture of a robotic system or an automation system for highway maintenance. And a lot of this is generic for any kind of robotic system. One of the things that is specific for the highway is a material handling system. For example, you'll need to be delivering paint to the roadway, or you need to be sealing cracks, or you need to be delivering bitumen, or you need to be carrying dots, spots dots, for example. So there's a lot of material handling that goes on on the systems. Sometimes that's actually a fairly complicated part of the process, a lot of modeling involved, and so forth. This was early on in the center. Uh, these are uh, raised pavement markers, or bots dots, so the reflective markers that you see separating the lanes. We developed a couple of different systems. This was a robotic system to replace missing raised pavement markers. The linear slide countered the vehicle speed, so the dot was applied at zero speed relative to the ground. Uh, there's a, again, there's a bituminous material, so there was quite a lot involved in getting that material down and placing the dot all within that very short period of time. It's actually a fairly complex thing to do. This is out there in the future, although most of the things that are on this vehicle, we have done in one shape, one form or another. We've done stencilless painting on the highway. Again, a lot of process modeling to model how the paint goes down. When you have a stencil, it's easy, but when you don't have a stencil, getting a nice clean edge becomes very difficult. Long reach robots to give you the workspace that you need on the highway. It's a difficult environment for robotics. You need a large workspace. You need to cover at least one lane, maybe two. You need to reach out far enough into the lane. You need to deliver high payloads. And you need to be relatively accurate. Not the kind of accuracy for semiconductor manufacturing, but it still needs to be pretty accurate. We've d developed various forms of crack sealers, small mobile, mobile robots, manipulators that do that as well, flying robot for inspecting bridges, and all of this is being run by the one guy in the truck. He's driving it at the same time, too. Early on, uh, telerobotics and teleoperations work was in hazardous environments, for example, in the nuclear industry. So if you needed to be dealing with nuclear cores, for example, you were, you were in a whole other room in the building, and you're manipulating the material through an interface. You have a display, hand controller, and so forth. Same kinds of things. A lot of what we do is towards safety. Uh, we also try and gain efficiency as well, because otherwise the technology won't be out there. Very dangerous environment. You're out there in mixed traffic. Caltrans workers, ceiling cracks. So this is just an example application. People going by at 60 miles an hour in the next lane over. 
We've developed a lot of technologies that pull the workers from the road, put them into the vehicle. So this is a, um, actually a fairly simple mechanism that allows sealing of longitudinal cracks uh, with just the operator in the vehicle. And so you can see there's, there's a fairly simple arm and a delivery system for laying down the pavement, the uh, bituminous material. I characterize it fairly simple, but the people who worked on it may disagree with me. Again, a lot of the problem is getting the hot bitumen from, A, getting it melted fast enough, getting it through the system and delivered at the right temperature, the right pressure. Uh, one of the problems that was run into with this is where the productivity was so much greater that it becomes a problem of supplying the material. The, we were able to seal, I think it was about a factor of 10 increase in productivity using this system. And so we're pulling people from the pavement. I don't personally see it for this application, but for some jobs, eventually we go back to the 50s and people are remote operation from offsite. So perhaps this is from the Transportation Management Center. Another example of remote operation, this was some work that we did in the 90s. This is a uh, remote operated front end loader. So the guy's got this backpack. We were kind of laughing about the system. You look at it now, and he's got this backpack. He looks like he's ready for a spacewalk. But you know, nowadays, maybe it'd all fit in this little hand controller. In any case, the idea is there's avalanches, landslides, very dangerous situations, devil slide, for example, where they need to clear the dirt. You don't want to have the operator in the vehicle, ideally. And, and the, we've had secondary slides where the operator and the machine have been not washed off of devil slide into the ocean. Uh, I'm not sure if they recovered them, actually. But uh, this was actually commercialized. Uh, I think Washington State bought a couple. There's teleoperation, and then there's telepresence. And the idea here is you're giving not just the ability to control the machine, but you're giving the, the operator a feel for what's going on at the work site. There's telemedicine nowadays. Uh, telerobotics and telepresence for interplanetary explorers. So you get both a visual, but you may get some tactile or force feedback. And we're doing some things along these lines. Uh, making things transparent is the idea. So it, this is a uh, road, believe it or not, that is a road over uh, State Route 108 in Sonora. And they allow this road to close over the wintertime. I'm sure that the people from Finland have Similar situations, probably a lot worse. Uh, ballpark 30 to 40 feet of snow builds up. You can see right here there is a snow stake visible, and that's what they're supposed to guide off of. The problem is most of the snow stakes are gone and can't be replaced for various reasons. So what they do is they, they move up on top of the snow, they lay out a route, and then they just chew down the 30 feet till they get to the roadway. We've developed GPS-based systems that provide current vehicle location, current vehicle heading, your height above the roadway, uh, also obviously some status and heartbeat information to make sure that things are working right, where you've been, where you're going, local landmarks. They like to know not only just where they are relative to the lane, but where they're at in the section of the road. So with that, they can do the job using the display. They don't have to do the, I mean, in a way, you can think of that as sort of the staking out that you need to do for the construction site. So we're sort of doing stakeless road clearing. And they do the road clearing, and eventually they get down to the dirt, or the, down to the pavement in this case. And again, this can be quite a lot deeper in many situations. OK. On to laser measurements. We're doing research right now in a couple of different areas. This, uh, this is not our bridge profile measurement system. This is an uh, example of what happens when things break down in the uh, profile measurement system, whether, whether it's the way they do the measurements, how the database gets updated, or there's a rehab job and the database isn't updated, or something breaks down in the permitting. And these kinds of things happen. They get to be very expensive, sometimes very deadly. So we've developed a laser-based so this is just a uh, scanning laser. And with the forward vehicle motion, we get a helical scan of the underside of the bridge. 
GPS for, for rough location. We have a speed sensor for, for integrating the longitudinal direction, wireless communication from the uh, sensing system into the vehicle, and then some post-processing to allow the extraction of the dimensions. So this is just giving the idea of this helical scan as you go through and all the Greek lettering, as my wife likes to call it. And the data comes in. It's not automatically extracting the dimensions. One of the things that we found working with the operators and also just working with this technology is keep the human in the loop. The human is really good at certain things. The computer is good at certain things. We have this interface. This was all custom developed for this. They can click on a lane stripe. So they can say, here's a lane stripe. Click on it once. Then it just identifies the whole thing. It can do automatic identification as well, but it's just better to keep the human in the loop. There's, once things have been identified, it'll extract the horizontal dimensions. It'll extract vertical above the lane stripes. There's sanity checks by the operator. Again, the whole thing, having a human in the loop for a lot of this makes a world of sense. We're also doing, and, and this is in conjunction with the Office of Land Surveys, so Mark Turner's group, Mark's in back, and Kevin Aiken has been instrumental in this. Uh, he's educated us tremendously. Uh, he's almost turned a couple of my guys into surveyors. Not me. I've managed to avoid that. But we're doing um, sort of evaluation of commercial sensors. We're doing controlled tests so that we can do head-to-head -head comparisons between these scanners. It's difficult. I'll say this even though some of the vendors are in the room. It's difficult to take their specs and do direct comparisons. So we're doing shoot-offs in a controlled scenario to do that. We're also doing pilot tests just to evaluate how the sensors work in normal operation and to develop some workflows. And this was uh, a DTM that was provided by one of the vendors from the scan data. This is a uh, highway right near UC Davis, so laser-based DT laser DTM. And this was the uh, actual scan data combined with some RGB photo information. And in conjunction with that, we're following on by doing some case studies and field trials with Caltrans. So this was, uh, I think it's about two weeks ago. Uh, there was a um, bolt pattern. This is on the Bay Bridge right above uh, Yerba Buena Island. So actually, this is the uh, part of the new structure going up. Caltrans needed to know the exact location of these four bolts. And they can do that with, with a uh, total station. But part of this process is learning how these technologies apply in, in such a situation. So Kevin and a couple of my engineers were out looking for the uh, location of these bolt holes, or these bolts. This is a uh, rough map of where this occurred. I don't think we'll worry about that too much. This is one of the scan images. So you can see where the scanner was. You can see this is that post from the new structure. And we're quite far, the scanning locations are quite far from the uh, bolt pattern, by the way. This is a scan from the other side. Uh, this is from the uh, north side. The other was the south. Now, these are the bolts of interest, these two on this side. And this is the laser scan, that portion of the laser scan. So you can see the amount of detail that you can make out. And this is the other side. So now we're on the north end. Again, those two bolts, this is what we're looking at in here. Uh, we're also, while we were there, I'm not sure if this was needed or not, but we had this uh, cross beam. And there was essentially zero noise in looking at this in the scan data. Now, you want to make sure that things are accurate. And this was one of the targets that was placed. So this was visible in the scan image. And I, I'm, I didn't know, but I'm guessing Kevin measured it with a total station, right? Yep. Relative to the total station measurements were within one millimeter on the vertical and, and two millimeters on the horizontal, or better than that, actually. A tenth of a million, yeah, yeah, a lot better than that. So these were the specs. Maybe I should just read what's on here instead of integrating in public. Um, 
So we needed to be a centimeter horizontal error and seven millimeters vertical, and we were obviously well within that with the scanner, so things look really good. But again, it's good to have the independent confirmation of that. Now this is the processing of the data, uh, and, it, and it's, it's looking at the various scans and comparing registration points that it can see in the scans and looking at the error within there. And again, for the specs that we're, we need, well within the tolerances. So we've also done a lot of work in, uh, in, in information systems. We're developing uh, a, a system architecture that right now we're applying for roadside inventory, but it actually is a lot more general than that. Generally speaking, a lot of existing legacy database systems within Caltrans or within anywhere else. Um, for example, a lot of things there are in Microsoft Access or in Oracle. We've developed some layers that are based on open standards, open software. Uh, and we've also interfaced with the data collection systems. Uh, Trimble, since you guys are here. But actually, this is what we have. And we've developed ways of doing the visualization using KML. And again, KML was a good choice in this case because it's an open standard. Google doesn't, well, I think Google's <laughs> opening it up. And Esri, for example, has another viewer. We've been using Google's viewer, but it's not limited to that. Uh, the viewer does have the ability to add time into the mix, so you can do animations. I don't have an animation to show you here. But for example, we've had cases where we've overlaid Doppler radar, and you can see it evolve over the image. This is just tracking one of our research vehicles, showing that we do go in circles quite often. Um, this is traffic visualization data. This comes off of the Caltrans sensors. Uh, and we've got, if you click on any one of the locations, it'll tell you where it's at, what the flow is at that point, and, and we've color coded based on the flow. So it's sort of a, a really rudimentary, but fairly effective view of the traffic flow and in some sense is a portion of an ATMS. Again, the Doppler radar and this would animate. So this was actually just overlaid over the Google imagery. You can also do overlays of traffic cams. So if, you know, there, you'll see a lot of public sites where you can pull up the traffic cameras, overlay it on top of the Google Earth imagery so you can see what's going on. We've done a lot of work in asset management for roadside inventory, particularly for culverts. Caltrans Roadside Inventory Group, uh, was Manuel Morales, had developed an actually a really effective culvert database tool. It was in, as it's, it's in um, access, sorry, and it, it does what they need, but they don't have a way to visualize the data across the organization in a uniform way. So we've been looking at that, and, and we feel that you know, Google or Esri KML Viewer, uh, Esri Explorer, I think it is, either one of those combined with this architecture, which we've been able to interface to as an access database and pull the information out through the layers that we've added. This shows where the existing culverts are, where the endpoints are. Uh, you click on an end treatment. It tells you all the information from his database. It's an inlet. Uh, What's the location? When did they collect the data? And you can view the whole system. You can, you can expand out. You can see the culverts throughout the state. So it's a it's pretty uh, interesting visualization tool. And you can get a lot more detail. You can pull up from the database. You can pull up pictures of the individual culverts, click on a button to schedule maintenance, and so forth. So view is that the automation is going to be playing a big role for maintenance and construction. And I think one of the things I've learned today is from this process on lean construction, I think there's a lot to do together. And some things that I hadn't envisioned at all, but it's, it's been a very interesting day. And all these things I think we can, we can provide. And we want to provide. Again, I'm a taxpayer too. I don't, I don't just pull off the system. I'd like to see things more efficient. We want to help Caltrans do their job better, and of course, the rest of the world as well. That's basically it. We're heading in some of the uh, same directions as Roundhouse Group. We see this as a, as a model of digital model-based planning and automation for the highway 
operations, really across the board. Multiple layers, so it's at the, the planning and design level, really at the build level, and then this is at the operations and maintenance level. We've done a lot of work in the automation side, particularly down in this level. Some of our work falls in here, and then things are kind of migrating across the board. What this shows, Larry kind of gave me a hard time for this. This is my diagram. I'll take credit for it. It's monstrosity. There's worse versions of this, by the way. But the purple things, or blue, or whatever they are, are projects or systems that we've worked on or enabling technologies. And again, a lot of it feeds into this automation. Then there's these groups of projects that are feeding into the higher levels, trickling into the middle and kind of across the board. Really, this is very preliminary. There's a lot of future work that we see in this area. This is where we really see to start, start to see a lot of payoff for this is when we start combining the systems. That's the end of the show, I think. It's trying to tell me something. <laughs> any, uh, any questions? I guess we should click to exit. Or shall we move right along? It's all right with me.